Joy, Judy, and you and me. Okay. Okay. So it's all yours. Thank you. I want to thank you all for um, joining us this evening to do some work with the Thunder Perfect Mind. Um, are th is there someone who would like some basic information about who, what, where, when? I think it would help us, Hal. I think we're all okay. kind of Good. wondering what all right. the world is going Good. on. Um, so the Thunder Perfect Mind, there is only one copy that uh, exists. It was found in the desert uh, in central Egypt in 1945 um, uh, in the jar that um, I sometimes call the Jesus jar, but is uh, better known as the jar in which the Nag Hammadi library was found. 52 books, um, um, most of which had not been known before, and almost all of which seem to be related to some early Christ movement group or another. Um, and so this is one of a number of, uh, one of these 52. The Thunder Perfect Mind is probably the second most well-known of those 52 documents. Uh, more well-known is the Gospel of Thomas, um, which uh, is quite widely distributed uh, and, um, and has a lot more publications about it. But the Thunder Perfect Mind has been quite uh, well known, especially among artists and artist communities since its discovery in 1945, or rather really since Elaine Pagels included it in her The Gnostic Gospels book of the late 1970s. And, um, and so from Elaine's work, a lot of artists have picked it up and, and used it in a variety of ways. Uh, we can return to that if, if we, we need to. Um, so um, how many of you uh, were able to read the text or, or maybe um, let's say, uh, were there some of you who were not able to read the text? Good. All right. Uh, so just to, then to say a few more introductory things about the text, this is really then in one voice uh, is a um, voice which identifies itself in a whole bunch of ways. In fact, it's uh, really a fairly traditional kind of ancient Mediterranean literature in which a divine voice um, basically talks about itself. The, the, often these voices are uh, female or male, or in some cases, uh, some of both. And so this is a speech by a god or goddess figure that basically whose, whose um, purpose is mainly simply to talk about who she or he is. Um, so this is a fairly standard uh, text of that kind in the, in the um, ancient Mediterranean. In this case, however, you'll notice that it is almost or for the better part, it's a, it's a female voice. It's a I am, and then usually the I am is finished by some descriptive picture of a divine female. This then in the ancient world, as I said, is not too surprising that it would be a, a goddess figure. Uh, and that would be proclaiming herself. Although there are many of these kinds of pieces of, of literature by 
gods that are proclaiming themselves. Indeed, in the the Christian scriptures as well as the Hebrew scriptures, there are texts in which a great I am identifies her or himself. In the um, book of Proverbs, in the Hebrew scriptures, there is a major figure like this called um, um, wisdom. And she occurs in about six of the chapters of the book of Proverbs as a divine female proclaiming herself. Um, also in the Hebrew scriptures, you have a divine figure um, ide identifying itself in Exodus as I am that I am. This is the, the figure that identifies itself in the desert to Moses in Exodus 3. And then in the, the um, Christian scriptures of the New Testament, uh, you have the figure of Jesus who uh, also identifies himself as the great I Am, 13 different times in the book of John. So the, Jesus primarily identifies who he is with the character of I am. And almost certainly um, uh, G, the way Jesus is framed in the uh, Gospel of John is intimating both uh, the book of Proverbs and the book of Exodus in in the way it speaks of of it uh, Jesus speaks of himself as the great I am. So, in other words, this is this is uh, this voice in the thunder perfect mind uh, has a number of companion voices in that same era. Sometimes in the biblical uh, literature and sometimes outside. There are a couple of things that we'll probably want to just note, a, note early on about the, about the Thunder Perfect Mind and that voice. So primarily female. So I am um, the, the first and the last, but then quite quickly uh, talking about I am uh, the whore and the holy woman, or I am she that uh, has a great we wedding, but I did not have a husband. Um, one of the many things that one notes about the primary femaleness of the Thunder Perfect Mind is that this voice often takes for herself um, characteristics of women that are um, made fun of. So, I am the whore um, is... Um, is taking on a, a um, negative description of a woman as the great as part of the great I am or of a of a great I am. Um, one will notice uh, to a certain extent, however, that although there are, I believe, twenty one different places in the Thunder Perfect Mind where. Uh, the thunder is identified as female. There are four or five in which uh, the thunder is identified as a male. Um, so one would say primarily a female character, but a little bit gender bent. Um, okay, so those are some basic. Um, uh, now let me say a couple of other whens. When was the Thunder Perfect Mind written. It's very difficult for us to tell since this is the only copy. Often it helps a lot if we have several different manuscripts to compare and contrast and see how, see how they are um, uh, framed in, in different manuscripts because manuscripts are almost always somewhat different. But since we only have one and in which uh, it, one in which there is no mention of a particular time and in which there's only one mention of a particular place, and that is Egypt. The text itself is written in Coptic, uh, 
which of course is the first alphabetized language uh, uh, in Egypt. So one might think that uh, this is um, an Egyptian book. Uh, I, I tend to think so, but I am in um, a minority of scholars. Um, most scholars think it was originally written in Greek and translated into Coptic. We, of course, don't have the, the, any such Greek um, piece or, 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 or any kind of even fragment of the Thunder Perfect Mind in Greek. Uh, so the other, so we, the the carbon dating of this text uh, is uh, is from the mid third century CE. So that would be uh, again about two hundred and fifty years or so, maybe even uh, um, in the fourth century. Um, 250 to 350 would be when this manuscript is dated. That, however, doesn't mean much in that, for instance, if you compare this to a lot of the manuscripts of the New Testament, most of those are not as early as 250 to 350. Most of them are um, at least a century and maybe three or four centuries later as a manuscript but we probably date most of them in the first or second century. So a document that's in the third or fourth century um, is um, a, as, a, as a manuscript. Um, that doesn't mean when it's written. It simply means that it's when the copy um, uh, was written. Uh, we're, basically, none of our manuscripts see of uh, of all of this kind of literature, none of them seem to be the original one. But we have a lot of broken and somewhat whole manuscripts that are um, that are from somewhere between the late 200s and and 1100. Uh, but we think they're probably written in the first or second uh, century. So we can only surmise when. Um, when the Thunder Perfect um, Mind was written. Um, and we think maybe Egypt. Egypt, of course, is a very cosmopolitan place at that point. Well, let me stop for a moment. You all have read it. Um, and uh, let's see uh, whether there are some immediate thoughts you have about your reading and any um, next steps and questions or or thoughts that any of you would like to um, bring up at this point. I have a question about the, the title. Yes. Well, what, so, do, where does it come from and what does it mean? Yeah, uh, great question. Um, so um, as those of you who have heard me before, um, most, even though I've studied this stuff in a whole bunch of ancient languages, the answer is I don't know. Um, the words, the thunder perfect mind, um, don't occur in the text. Um, so there, the word mind does, um, but uh, the, only, the place where we find the thunder perfect mind is in the title with no explanation at all. Now, here is a kind of a, a an explanation to talk about it as title, but it really doesn't help your good question. Um, uh, so most titles in the ancient world um, were not um, made or written by the author or authors. Usually a title in the ancient world is not something that the author is interested in, nor is the author, are the authors often interested even in their own name being on it. But the, usually the, the title of an ancient manuscript is added by the copy because copyists, of course, are probably 
and they keep one from not being being confused with the other. Usually, the copyist, usually between fifty and one hundred and fifty years later, add the title. So we just have no clue, frankly. Now you will see in some commentary that they say, "Oh, gods sometimes use thunder to um, uh, uh, to." connote who they are and that's true but there is, i don't think there's much thunderous about the way this divinity um actually um describes herself um so i'm sorry i don't know and i don't think any of my colleagues do either thanks for the good question i want to, excuse me for interrupting you. i wanted to ask you if we might have everybody put their um um, place, put themselves on mute because we're getting a little feedback. Um, so if everybody could check. We have a couple of people who have not put their mute on yet. Okay. All right. So other other thoughts or questions um, um, at this early juncture in, in our hour together? Well, this is Joy, and I, um, I really, I am wondering what the purpose of it is. And to me, when I've read it, it's saying that I, the I am, is in everyone, no matter what they do or what they think, and how they act. And it's a kind of to me, it's saying. You you don't look at people and go, oh, you're a good person, a godlike person, because this God is in the whore, is in the um, the woman that can't give birth, the the ones who lie about him, her. Um, so to me, it's a comforting uh, scripture because it's saying that really developing what that the I am is in everyone, mm -hmm. no matter how they act. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And, and, um, and it's, it really underlines the, the power of I am. Um, uh, in other words, that seems to be in the ancient and I amness. Um, so that this that this then tries to express itself with with a wide variety of 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 of, of life. Hal, Tim here. I think mm -hmm. this is I think this is connected to what Joy was saying. But for me, I'm I'm really struck by how, uh, in a sense, inclusive these descriptions are. That they they get beyond the the either or, but into a both and uh, mm -hmm. expression. You say yeah. anything about that? I think that's really important, and I would. Um, it's it's you, um, Tim, really uh, quickly getting at a deeper message in the text. I think very often um, people, when they read this for the first time, will see. In what I would call binary terms, either or. And it's almost, I think it's clearly way on uh, describe themselves. And so, um, for instance, uh, it's, it's not really opposites often. Um, but usually, the, often there are three kinds of um, descriptions in one sentence. Not not to to just hold on to to that. I think for me, one of my favorite ones of those is um, uh, the um, is uh, verse ten of chapter one. I am the slave woman of him who served me. I am the slave woman of him who served me. Um, so that's already um, uh, playing with um, the complexity of, of 
slavery and mastery um, and, and undercutting that. So a lot of these um, proclamations will undercut um, slanders of people and make them into more real people, people and more complex people. Um, uh, or uh, I am she the Lord of my, of my, my child there right after 10. Um, or I am my father's mother, my husband's sister, and he is my child in, in nine. Um, so, so very, very um, eager to make definitive identities go away and allow for complex identities to emerge. So there's plenty to talk about, but um, as um, many of you know from, uh, from other settings, I'm very interested in what you all are thinking. I myself think better when you're, you're um, expressing yourselves. Uh, so let's, um, I'm gonna be especially slow to pick up things that I might say to make sure that we get as many of your voices in as possible. I have another question. Uh, I, um, why, uh, in, in reading about this document, I read several people that said the original was, they thought the original was in Greek. I know you said you think it's Coptic. Where did they come up with that? How, what gives them an idea that the original would have been in Greek if this is the only copy? Uh, so um, the main reason to think that is that that time. Uh, so, uh, in other words, even though the Romans are in charge, even the Romans give deference to Greek. And all over the Mediterranean, um, the commercial language is Greek, even though the Romans have conquered every last place. Uh, so the main reason is uh, that it might be in Greek is more or less everything else that's important is is as well. Similarly, you will see that so in Egypt, of course, um, Alexander the Great, three um, plus centuries before, um, comes to Egypt to make what he thinks will be the greatest city ever. And that is Alexander and Alexandria. And so Alexandria is in Egypt and all of the great thinkers that move there or learn there for probably a good 400 years, they are all reading and writing in Greek. So, so for instance, Coptic itself is um, a promotion of Greek Greco uh, Roman and and really Greek domination in that, that the Egyptians have. Um, that, um, in other words, it's not the first writing, of course, because Egypt has written so much for so long. But that's hieroglyphics, and that's not a language, or that's not an alphabet. Um, so, so what has happened in the probably in the second century CE? What has happened in Egypt is that it is forced, in order to get recognition by the Greco-Romans, it is forced to have an alphabet. And Coptic really isn't an, some kind of new language except for its alphabet. So, it, so finally then in the second and third century, um, Egypt, you know, uh, becomes recognized linguistically because it has a Greco-Coptic alphabet. Um, so that's that. Those are all kind of big picture reasons why it might be in Greek. Um, so I am one of five folks 
published book length treatment of the Thunder Perfect Mind. And, and we translated, made a new translation of that from the Coptic. Um, we found in, not only is this in a, an Egyptian language, and not only does it mention Egypt once, but um, we found um, poetic um, frames of reference and uses in Coptic. So in other words, there are rhythms and rhymes and, and imagery that only make sense in Coptic. So, um, so we have said in that book, we have said that we, are, we would, uh, against the grain, we, we think probably that this is profoundly um, anchored in, in Coptic. Now, the weird thing about that, of course, is that Coptic itself is not altogether um, Egyptian <laughs> because it comes out of the Greco-Roman influence. So that's, that's kind of where I would land there. And, and if those of you who want to follow up on that, there's a whole chapter in, in The Thunder Perfect Mind um, that, that lays that out. Um, it, we, in, in all parts of the, that book, a, um, a, a real deep um, picture of all of the Coptic, but it's, it's relatively intelligible by, by those who don't know, know Coptic. Well, I have a different kind of a question. Um, this has been very helpful to me to learn about the language thing. I did not know this, but what I'm kind of interested in, in looking at the text itself, all those contradictions we have between I'm this, but I'm the opposite that at the same time. I'm, what my question seems to go around with is the relationship between the divine and the human. Because it sounds like it's a, a divine entity, I am, who is um, speaking about a human kind of experience. Is this implying that the um, divine figure wants to identify itself as um, understanding humans or being close to humans or what's the relationship you see between the divine and the human yeah no that's really at the heart of what i think is the genius of of this this theological language because it it depends almost entirely on comparisons between humans and the divinity um, there's really almost nothing that claims um and I am that doesn't have to do with humans. Uh, so this is propo proposing um, a divinity that is complexly mixed with humanity. Um, again, I think Christian theologians have been mostly interested in telling how divinity and and humanity are different than one another. Um, but here you have um, a primary literary effort to, to say that um, whoever, uh, humanity, whoever divinity is, is, needs to be thought of complexly in terms of who humans are. Um, and again, um, I'll, I'll probably talk a little bit more about, I think, the, the really profound character of this very available divinity. So one of the things that, um, that the two published pieces I have, and, and you, you all will know that um, the Thunder Perfect Mind is one of 10 new Christ documents from the first or second century um, that I have added to the um, 
to the regular New Testament of of Christian tradition um, in in my book, A New New Testament. And there we have added 10 different newly discovered uh, texts that are in the larger um, Christ um, family of texts. Uh, and, and so you can read that whole text um, in a New New Testament. But in both of these places, um, it's been very interesting to, to see that the I am is pretty vulnerable. Uh, so um, in, in the majority of places where the I am speaks, the I am includes um, self as being thrown to the ground or slaughtered or um, humiliated um, or fearful. Uh, so this is a divinity which is um, uh, un in many ways under siege and being hurt um, uh, quite deeply, as well as being able to say, I am the first and the last. So it's not that this is a powerless divinity, but it's one that is very vulnerable and, and uh, pained. Uh, so this is, um, I think, uh, very close to what you're talking about, Shirley. So in other words, add alongside of this, the fact that um, you, this, this divinity does not talk about herself except in, in human terms. And some of those terms are deeply ambivalent about her power and her loss and woundedness. My favorite combination of those is in which she says, I am she who exists in all fears and in trembling boldness. I don't know if I can be heard. Please. Is this Diana speaking? Yes, thank you. Yes, you're being heard, Diana. Thank right you so very much. Uh, I find this so incredibly interesting. I can't thank you enough for the link to, uh, to hearing this. I had just finished reading Why Religion by Elaine Pagels and reading Thunder. And uh, I can't help but think in this discussion uh, that what it says to me is, I am is not separable from anything. You cannot mm -hmm. separate it out of life itself because God is life. And therefore, you know, I think of a phrase that sometimes people will say, the many faces of God, meaning mm -hmm. everyone you encounter and uh, how there is divinity in everything. And, and I think of Kabir's quote when he said, because I think in some ways across the world, you can find the divinity in, uh, in religions and they can be transposed upon one another. But Kabir would say, I am the source within the source. And mm -hmm. in biblical, uh, I'm going to, I hope I'm not ignorant on this, but I'm going to say it anyway. Uh, I'm very caught up with the idea that the Christ presence, Christ, existed before the world. So mm -hmm. it says to me, nothing can be separated from anything because everything is God and divine. And uh, I also think of uh, a Hindu uh, quote, which would say, I am that, I am not that, which is not separating it. It's putting it into a wholeness by the opposites. So I'm going to stop babbling, but I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you for letting me mm -hmm. say something. Yes, likewise. Well, what do some of you make of, of 
the vulnerability and woundedness of this character. Well, this is Tim. Part of, part of what it has me thinking about is what's happening with this other, the other part of your life with the West Star Institute and the God and the Human Future seminar and their, mm -hmm. their, their work around this, the theme of a, a weak uh, God, a theology mm -hmm. of a God mm -hmm. of weakness. Right. Yes, I um, I'm in the process of 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 um, writing a book on um, uh, vulnerable divinity and and I I um, uh, I use um, Jack Caputo's work on the weakness of God in in that in direct reference to to the Thunder Perfect Mind. So one of the things that is obvious here to those of us who think in first and second century terms is, um, well, I would, I would set it up this way. Uh, in most of the texts uh, in the ancient world where a goddess or god described themselves, the last thing they will, they will ever say and I would say the thing they more or less never say is how weak and hurt and vulnerable they are. They're always the best, the most powerful, the only, and, and, the, and, and completely good and pure. So it's, 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 um, going really against the grain of much of, of thinking about divinities um, in that time to have such a prominent vulnerability and, and weakness and woundedness. Now, one of the things that I have in writing um, is that there is actually one other first or second century text that does have a divinity that is wounded and powerful. And that's Jesus, especially in the Gospel of John. So in the Gospel of John, as I alluded to earlier, uh, Jesus himself, it's the only place that Jesus himself uses I am as a way of describing himself as divine. Um, uh, and I can go into the, the Greek there if we, if we need to. Um, but uh, not only does, does Jesus call himself this great I am in, in the Gospel of John, but Jesus is also tortured to death in the Gospel of John. Um, so in other words, here too, you have a deeply vulnerable and wounded God who is also has some power, um, some divine power. Uh, and so that's why it's, it's a really interesting question among folks reading Thunder today is whether just because thunder as a document was found in a jar that had mostly Jesus documents. But this text, as you may have known in your reading, this text does not um, use the word Jesus at all. Um, and is primarily female. Now it's not, of course, uncommon to think of Jesus in female terms in the first and second century. Um, Paul does that in the, in first Corinthians quite clearly when Paul compares Jesus or says Jesus is wisdom herself. Um, uh, so um, it's, that's not out of the question either, but certainly um, it, it is a, um, 
it's not very, not very many people are willing to say that Thunder and the Gospel of John are, might be written about the same persona. Um, or um, in the case of Paul in 1 Corinthians, that thunder and wisdom and Jesus are more or less the same persona. The case for that is are, are really two things in terms of uh, what we might call material culture, and that is that it's in the same jar. <laughs> um, uh, uh, and, and Jesus and thunder are in the same jar, um, and, and that jar has a lot of books in it, um, uh, most of which are, are about Jesus. But similarly, one of the major things we almost know about uh, Nag Hammadi, this jar found in the desert, and become a library. Um, we are, I would say, again, we're not quite there in knowing it, but I would say probably the majority of scholars think that what was, what we found in a jar actually existed in a library of a Pacomian monastery three miles away from where we found it. I mean, and that, that, um, that Pacomian monastery is fourth century at least. So um, there is a possibility that the Thunder Perfect Mind was, was in the library of this early Christian monastic movement. Um, that's not not completely to be taken straight up as as a uh, a winning argument because the other document that um, exists in that jar is a partial copy of Plato's Republic. And that of course also does not have Jesus in. Oh, why then does it have, um, is it collected with, as you said, um, Christ documents? If Jesus is not in there, is there another way of understanding Christ that enables us to identify this with Christ documents? Well, again, um, if you look at the Nag Hammadi text altogether, a bunch of them use Jesus, a bunch of them use Christ, and a bunch of them use other things that are uh, explicitly related to 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 um, Jesus or Jesus Christ. Um, uh, it's just that here in Thunder we don't have any of those. Um, nor do we have. So there are, I think, five in Nagamati that don't use Jesus at all. But but um, for instance, the gospel. If you read the Gospel of Philip which is also in the Nakamati, Jesus is all over the place and described in all kinds of different ways. Um, um, and and um, the Gospel of Thomas, which has really only been found completely in, in the Nakamati, Jesus says 114 short chapters, and there's nothing else but Jesus there. Um, the same with the... Uh, um, uh, uh, a, a number of books that are related to Peter and Philip and Paul as well. So that wasn't an answer, um, but I but I'm not sure uh, what um, we can think of uh, otherwise about that. So um, I guess I'm um, also wanting to talk a little bit today uh, about two other things that are related to this kind of vulnerable um, 
divinity. Uh, one is a, something that scholars in New Testament and early Christianity have been thinking about for the last 30 years, and that's the violence of Roman rule. Um, so, for instance, in contrast to most of the last um, 1900 years, um, we have now have a lot of folks interested in thinking about how Rome's violent rule of the entire Mediterranean basis is deeply related to almost all documents we have about Jesus. So let me say that just a little bit more clearly. Um, one of the main things that people say about Jesus in the canonical New Testament, but also in other texts, is that he was tortured to death. Um, uh, in other words, the crucifixion. Um, but the weird thing for conventional Christians is that, you know, and this is this certainly was true of me for my first 20 years, when I when I learned in my first stages about Jesus being crucified, I thought the only one who was crucified was Jesus and those two other guys. Um, uh, and that Jesus was more or less the only one whose crucifixion mattered. What we now know from much Roman literature and I think much um, early Christ movement literature is that um, crucifixions were happening by the hundreds of thousands by Rome. In other words, the fact that Jesus was crucified wasn't his uniqueness. It was his complete part in the lives of almost everyone. It's quite clear, I, I would say, that every, every family in Egypt, um, at least a... Um, uh, a larger family in Egypt, every family had somebody who had been crucified. Um, uh, Josephus, the Jewish historian of the first century, says that Pilate himself, in the, only the 10 years that he was ruling um, Jerusalem and Judea, um, he crucified 10,000 people. Um, so, for me, this is, this is at the heart of how we need to think about the Thunder Perfect Mind. Because that's what the Thunder Perfect Mind does, is she identifies herself as the people who have been thrown down and cast out and, and slaughtered viciously. And the people who are, are women, who, who are always called names and not granted any recognition. Um, so she is the one who is divine, but is the one who's really important for us to know, see how thunder works that way. Um, uh, and, and, so that thunder is prim is gender bended, but primarily female is um, also a, another way of thinking about Jesus as a someone who was tortured to death by Romans. Um, the second thing I I'm more and more interested in is um, the way in the last century it's been impossible to, uh, I think, to think straight or even crooked about, um, about an almighty God that's all loving. In other words, folks who, who think about God after the Jewish Holocaust have not been able to put put the common Christian God who is all powerful and all loving together. That Humpty Dumpty has fallen. Um, 
what I'm very interested in is that it's not just thunder, but for instance, um, uh, the Gospel of Mark, as well as some of the other Gospels, but the Gospel of Mark does this most powerfully, and that Jesus, when Jesus is tortured to death in the Gospel of Mark, uh, the only thing Jesus says on the cross is, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? So yelling at God about being abandoned is the final picture of in the Gospel of Mark. Whoops, that's not quite true. Look then at the, the, the resurrection. But the resurrection in Mark is very underwhelming. Um, because the earliest doc, uh, earliest manuscripts of Mark have basically um, the empty tomb in which the women come, Jesus isn't there, a young man says, go and find Jesus in Galilee where he said he was going to be and go tell, and go tell the um, disciples. And the last sentence in the Gospel of Mark is, and the women were afraid and ran away and told nothing. End of Gospel. So in other words, there, um, Mark is also portraying a Jesus who is underwhelmingly resurrected. That is, no one knows except the reader and the women who the young man. Um, so you just for a second. I don't know that everybody in this group is understands what you mean by the end of the Mark, the gospel of Mark ending there. Yeah. So, so the, um, you will almost everybody's gospel of Mark. You'll see either a explanation or a, or a, um, uh, quote or a, a sub uh, a footnote in which there are four different um, main endings to the Gospel of Mark. The, the one that's the oldest is the one that ends in chapter 16, verse 8, which ends where I said it was. Some Gospels only have that, that oldest manuscript. Um, or set of manuscripts, and some add two or three other um, endings because they, you know, a conventional Christian publisher would not want um, such an underwhelming um, uh, resurrection. So it uses later texts to show a much more triumphant um, uh, Markan resurrection. So anyway, there, what I want to notice is just that we are pretty broken by not just one Holocaust, but a whole bunch of Holocausts we know about now. And uh, this is so similar to, um, to the, the basic character of life under Rome. Hundreds of thousands of of um, crucifixions, hundreds of thousands of enslavements, um, lots of poverty. So anyway, those are two other things I'm um, thinking about um, with, with the Thunder Perfect Mind. And for me, I, I often am ready to say that the Thunder Perfect Mind is probably the most theologically coherent picture of Jesus. In other words, what she says in the Gospel, in, in, in Thunder Perfect Mind, is coherent with much that you find inside Paul, who says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, but not I, but Christ lives in me. So this, the crucifixion is an ongoing reality in the life in Christ. For Paul, Mark is the same. So it feels to me as if the thunder may be one of the most powerful I am statements about 
this kind of divinity in, in the time of Christ and in the time of Rome's violence. I'm going to stop talking so much, see if anyone wants to catch up or protest. Oh, so Joy, you're, you're talking, but I think you're mic. You're, you're not on the mic. Okay, now I'm here. Okay. <laughs> this is Joy. And I want to think of vulnerability as reachability or being able to relate. And so I guess I'm pulling it like the Trinity. You know, the Trinity idea is that God is within you and is part of life and not this separate thing out somewhere else. And so I think that maybe the sense of vulnerability is not a weakness. It's a humanness. It's a, I can relate to this. And, and I think that really is a big part. You want to say a little bit more about... about uh, just a real important part of why Jesus was here. Not quite. Could you say that again? Uh, uh, you, I, we lost... Uh, at least I lost your sound. Okay. Uh, all I'm thinking is that Vulnerability is not necessarily weakness. Uh -huh. It's a sense of being reachable, mm -hmm, is right. being able to relate to. And actually, it's similar to the concept of Trinity. Right. Because the Trinity says, God isn't way out there and Christ out here and this, but it's all part of us. And that's what I see vulnerability as. It's, it's, I think it's a humanness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes a sense. And but and our, I wasn't quite sure. Were you you say? I think if I heard you correctly, it wasn't just weakness. Or were, are you saying it isn't weakness? I'm saying it's not just weakness. But it is, is it weakness? I haven't thought about it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, and again, that's, I'm clearly in the middle of thinking about that. Um, so I appreciate you standing alongside of me in that regard. But for me, um, the the human consciousness seems like it's having to come to terms with um, not almightiness. That might be something different than weakness, um, but it's hard for us to, again, put together how to talk about God uh, when there's so, we, our consciousness has expanded to have to face these huge sets of losses. So I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm just saying, I think that's one of what, one of the things that's happening to us as we, as we think about God. I'd like to throw out another possibility, which is, but maybe I think you're, you were, what you're saying about the Trinity would not be foreign to that. Um, so, Hal, I think we're, um, can you hear me, Hal, or not? I can, yes. Because I think our reception is not great tonight, but we'll, we'll make do here. One of the questions that I have about this is I'm wondering if this, um, vulnerability might also pertain to a kind of dualism that we see in a number of these Nagamati texts where um, it seems like there's a reality in the invisible world, but there's another reality in the visible world. And this text is trying to help us find that there's no, that they're not separated, but rather one. And yet it's using dualistic terms to do that. 
uh, am I way off base, do you think, or is there something about that? I mean, I'm, I'm trying to come to terms with these um, contrasting ideas that seem to be so contradictory to each other. I think I see that in other texts where there's such a contrast between the world that we can't see and the world that we can. Mm -hmm. I think you're really um, uh, on the right track there, Shirley. I, I, I would probably be a little bit um, more hesitant to say that that's dualism, or that it's not dualism in thunder. Um, but in other words, when I think of, of the Gospel of, of Philip, um, a lot of that is multipleness, not no. dualism. Okay. So, but, and so I, but I think that that actually doesn't contradict your proposal. It adds to it. Well, I noticed that um, um, our hour is up. Um, uh, I'm grateful for this conversation and, and especially for, for your making uh, um, this, um, sure that this is probably going to be recorded, I think, or has been recorded, if I'm correct, Shirley. Yes, our goal is we're trying to record it. Unfortunately, we've had some bad signals. Um, I think we got most of what people were saying and we may need to keep on working on our technology but at least we're trying to record this and make it archived so that people will be able to see it. It's going to take us a couple of weeks probably to get the technology up and running right, but we're working on that goal. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for, for making that possible and, and to, the, to the rest of you. Thank you. And thanks so much for this very mind boggling experience. I, I just am thrilled that we had a chance to think about this text with you because I think when we read it without your help, we're swimming around in no man's land. So this has been very helpful, Hal. Well, thank, thank you. you. I want to thank you very much also. I very much appreciated listening to everyone and hearing you very much. Mm. Thank you too. I was clueless the first time I read it. So this has helped a lot. I'm, I'm looking forward to reading it again after having sat through the discussion. All right, thanks everybody. See you later. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Thank you very much.